folks, so I think we're going to go ahead and um, get started because we want to give Becky as much time as possible to work through her content and just have as much engagement as we can uh, for the program. So very quickly, my name is uh, Larry Reagan. Uh, my, my role in the EdTech Network is as the principal community aggregator, so it's my job, so, so to speak, to bring in diverse groups of individuals around these topics. So I really appreciate your coming today and, and sharing your ideas. We've got different disciplines, I know, represented today, which is kind of what we're trying to get to, so thank you for joining us. Um, Becky is our inaugural EdTech Connect speaker. So that's, yeah, I don't know if you get a plaque and $3 and gets her a cup of coffee or something, I'm not sure. Um, well, you said me a special uh, dessert. Oh, I did. No, he didn't okay. really. <laughs> <laughs> so I owe you that. I owe you that. It'd be my pleasure. So let me introduce Becky, uh, Becky uh, Passanou. Is it Passanou or Passanou? Passanou. Pass oh, geez, I wasn't even. <laughs> Passanou. Okay, thank you. It's French. It's French. French Canadian. Okay. Yeah. I'm, Sl I'm a Slovak guy, so those, those other languages are <laughs> tough for me. Uh, Becky's a professor in the School of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science here at Penn State. Uh, she's also a fellow with the TLT program, the Teaching and Learning with Technology group. And a lot of Becky's research has been based around looking at the use of a portion or a component of artificial language to help improve student writing and, and reading. And it's a really fascinating. I sat down with Becky a couple weeks ago, and she kind of walked me through the, the project. It's really interesting work. And I, I thank you for being here. So what we're going to do is have Becky sort of walk through her research project with us. Uh, and then we're gonna, we want to open it up and really get some dialogue, dialogue going. So if you have questions, make a note of those, and we'll engage you at the end. OK, Becky, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and thank all of you for being here. And uh, Haley, am I projecting OK? OK, great. So um, this is the logo for my new NLP lab here. I just joined Penn State a year and a half ago. And some of my students and uh, postdoc are uh, here in the front row. I'm really happy to be here at Penn State. And I'm going to be talking about this one aspect of um, something that I've gotten interested in since about uh, 2013 with um, uh, work that I did with Dolores Perrin. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about our lab, you can just uh, look for NL PSU NLP group and uh, you'll find our webpage. So I, I wanted to put up this slide on our collaborators about this particular topic that I'll be talking about today. It's um, work that started in 2004 with uh, someone who was then a PhD student at Columbia and now she's at um, um, University of Pennsylvania. We were, uh, working on how to score summaries that were produced by machines. And I was looking at reading comprehension literature in order to understand, well, how, how might somebody do this? And we weren't interested in language fluency or grammat grammaticality or um, those aspects of language. What we were interested in was the conceptual issue of what should go in the summary. And different people write uh, different summaries, and so that was the big issue. And, um, some of what I'll be talking about, Ani and I developed uh, back then. Then um, later on, we, we did try to automate it, but um, that, that was just uh, a tangential part of our work that we didn't pursue. Then when Dolores Perrin at Teachers College came to me and she said, I heard about your work and I think it would be useful for what I do because we do a lot of manual rubrics to understand how our teaching interventions affect um, students learning and uh, other things that go on in the classroom. So we started working together and these are a lot of students who worked uh, on the project. Um, then uh, some of them are here. So Chan Yang uh, developed some work that I'll be talking about a little bit today and she's here in the front row. So if you have questions about her work, she'll be able to address that. And then a student here at Penn State, Yan Jun Gao is now um, working on another aspect of it. So We've been working on different ways to automate this so that it's easier for other people to use, but the early work was on manual annotation. And why do we care about this for students and for classroom um, pedagogy? Well, asking students to summarize the main ideas of the text actually is very strategic for both their reading uh, comprehension and their writing skills. 
And that's in part because psychologists uh, who have looked at this uh, for many years, starting um, at least in the 80s, uh, posit these different kinds of cognitive processes that are involved in actually understanding a text that's being read or uh, figuring out what to say when you're summarizing it. And that's, you, you need to um, select the important ideas among all the ideas. So not all the ideas that are mentioned in the text are equally important. Um, then uh, generalization to omit detail is another aspect of this cognitive processing and then inference to um, draw implicit connections. But it's really the first two that are particularly important. And uh, in addition, there's no one way to write a good summary, even if you look at expert summaries. So you'll notice that um, like a Venn diagram, the different summaries are gonna have uh, some overlap in content. So I'm showing that here where if you uh, imagine that these are three different summaries, there might be a few ideas that all the summaries mention, and then some other ideas that subsets of summaries will mention, and then a long tail of a lot of ideas that are only mentioned once. And that doesn't mean that uh, these summaries are not good, they're just making different selections because there is no one single correct selection, but there is uh, a strategy of making sure that you mention the important ideas and um, they can be ranked in this way, uh, and that's part of what our method does. And one advantage of that, uh, as Dolores uh, Perrin pointed out uh, when we started working together, is that designing a reliable rubric to measure things like how many important ideas each summary contains is very labor intensive, and it's potentially subjective. People work to eliminate that subjectivity by measuring the reliability of their rubrics, and one that Dolores uh, developed is, was uh, found to be highly reliable, but that's just another uh, step in designing the rubric that adds additional human effort uh, to, to uh, acquire that reliability. Now, summaries are very concise. Each idea tends to be expressed once. That's the point of a summary. So uh, the key aspects of that are selecting the important ideas and also omitting unnecessary detail. And that could mean um, omitting aspects of a particular event that aren't as relevant like um, you know, the instrument that was used in order to do something. What matters is that you did it and something got uh, completed. Um, and that detail could be contained in uh, peripheral phrases in a sentence or um, the generalization could occur at the lexical level where you use a less specific word to refer to an event. The content evaluation task in uh, general can be seen as having two steps. One, you have to define an, a standard, and we define a standard from expert summaries. Uh, that is people who are um, uh, judged to be very literate and good at uh, writing summaries and finding the um, important ideas. And then uh, what we'll do is, what I'll do here is I'll show you how that standard is arrived at. And then the, once you have that, then you wanna compare that to uh, the summaries that you're interested in evaluating to quantify the proportion of important ideas. Now, of course, there are many other dimensions of the summary that can be evaluated in addition to this, but uh, that's the focus here. So the method that we, re we developed is referred to uh, sometimes as pyramid um, content annotation, pyramid analysis, or wise crowd analysis, because the basic idea is, uh, as I illustrated earlier with the Venn diagram, here we see it again, is that the importance of the individual ideas is an emergent phenomenon. Once you have a wise crowd, and you can actually count how many of the individuals in the crowd mention a particular idea, then you can um, rank the ideas in that way. So if you look at any one of these alone, all you'll see is you know, some uh, like six ideas per summary, and you won't know which one of them, especially if you're a machine, is the most important. So uh, this distinguishes the quality of the ideas by their quantity in the wise crowd. It's a very simple idea, but it has turned out to be very effective for this one dimension of evaluating summaries. So this uh, is a sort of preview of what we do, we try to find uh, something that we refer to as content units and then assign their weights. 
And the text that uh, I'll be illustrating with is an actual text that uh, Dolores used in an educational intervention called What is Matter? Um, and uh, I'm just uh, sort of schematically illustrating here that we have one content unit that, you know, this is one we'll see later. Matter is classified by physical and chemical properties. Let's say that has the highest weight. Everybody mentioned that one. Uh, then we might have another idea that's only mentioned by two and uh, other ideas that are only mentioned by one. And that's basically um, the two components of the representation, finding the distinct ideas and then weighting them in this way. So once uh, you've done that for all of the ideas in your wise crowd, uh, here I'm showing uh, parts of five actual summaries that were the wise crowd for this particular study, then um, you end up having something that we refer to as a pyramid because each one of these little squares represents an idea and the number of circles in the square represents how many of the wise crowd mentioned that idea. And it, it turns out that this is the typical distribution where you have a few ideas that everybody mentions and then some ideas that many people mention and then as you, in, you know, uh, um, go down the pyramid, there's ideas that, uh, a larger and larger set of ideas that a smaller subset of the wise crowd actually expresses in their summaries. And that is, uh, it's not really a pyramid because it's not a linear um, change in the number of um, content units, it's actually more Zipfian, which is very, very typical of all kinds of uh, language distributions. Roy. Well, here we just have five um, members of the wise crowd. So the, the highest frequency that you can have is five and the lowest is one. And I'll talk about why we have five here later on. Uh, that's an important question. Um, so uh, you know, I will get to that, but uh, first I, I just want to explain that once we have this model, then it can be used in this way where this is a new summary and we want to find all the phrases that mention any one of the model content units. And then uh, this shows that here's uh, this uh, actual student summary mentions that particular content unit that I illustrated earlier. In order to classify matter, we have uh, physical and chemical properties. So um, the summary would get five points for mentioning that one and then maybe four points for another one and two points for another one. And that would give you uh, a raw sum for all the ideas that are mentioned in the summary. And then there will be some ideas that are mentioned that don't occur in the pyramid. And so they would get a zero weight. And you need to quantify how many distinct ideas are mentioned as well in order to do the normalization, which I'll talk about now. So we have a couple of different ways of normalizing. Um, one is uh, that uh, something that we refer to as a quality um, normalization. So if you count the number of content units that are in the student summary, some of which might have a weight of zero, you could actually look at the pyramid and figure out, well, what's the maximum sum that you could assign to that same number of content units? So you would first use up all the weight five content units, and then if you still have content units left in the summary, then you'd start selecting weight four and so on in order to get the maximum sum, and then you divide the actual observed sum by that maximum that that same number of ideas could get. And that's the quality score. It basically says uh, uh, to the investigator, did the summary mention mostly important ideas of those that are included? And if uh, all the summary ideas are weight zero, then it's you know very, very poor summary and we don't see any of those uh, typically. Um, then we can do another score, a coverage score, which is uh, given the um, typical summary that one of the wise crowd uh, individuals wrote, how many content units did they have and what's the maximum sum that you could assign to that? And that basically gives you a, a different way to normalize, which is uh, something that we call coverage. It's, did the summary mention most of the important ideas that the wise crowd mentions or that we find emerging from the wise crowd? And then you can average these and, and we do that to get a sort of comprehensive score. So in order to get, have a good summary, you wanna have both high quality and good coverage. And you might have, um, 
a deficiency in either way. And that gives us a set of scores that are somewhat interpretable. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, later on. So uh, Roy raised this question of, um, well, you know, okay, uh, you can weight the ideas, but uh, he didn't really put it this way, but it's sort of how many people do you need in the wise crowd? Um, the way we answered that question or addressed that question is that we um, did some experiments. Now, this was with automatically generated summaries, but we did some experiments where uh, we had nine reference summaries. We had nine experts who summarized the same news material that was all on the same topic. And this was an activity that uh, started um, being um, repeated very frequently in the natural language processing community as people started developing automated summarization techniques um, in the early 90s, uh, I guess. And then the National Institute of Standards started running these challenges. So um, they had experts on hand that would write uh, summaries of the news that um, the automated summarizers were being tested against. And we um, collected additional ones from our own experts. So we started with nine reference summaries, assuming that, well, that's probably going to be enough. And uh, then what we did was uh, in many plots like this, where we um, build our content models uh, all the ways that we can with nine summaries, which is only one, and then all the ways that we can with eight summaries, which is nine, and then all the ways that we can with seven summaries, which is 36, and so on and so on, then we can uh, take any pair of summaries, like this blue one and this red one, that diverge if you use a content model with all nine summaries, and then ask, uh, how, uh, how far uh, down can you go in the total number of summaries that you use in your wise crowd before you get an overlap in um, your confidence score for your, your actual score that you assign? So in other words, each one of these points has a confidence interval around it, which is basically the spread in the scores that you get from using all the summaries, that you, all the um, sets, subsets of summaries to build your model that you could at that number of summaries. And so what we found was that around four or five summaries, then you start getting an overlap where you might actually have a summary that was judged as being the, the least good summary, getting scored above the one that was judged to be the best summary. And so um, that's one way of uh, deciding that, well, it looks like we need about four to five summaries we weren't quite satisfied with just one answer. So we actually tested many different ways. And I'm not gonna go into all of them here because uh, that's not um, the main uh, focus of the talk. But uh, we looked at the number of reference summaries for the probability of a misranking to be below 0.01. That was around five. The number of reference summaries for scores to correlate with the gold standard, about five. We looked at inter-annotator agreement. Uh, and if you have questions about how that was measured, I can address that later on. But on building the content model and then inter-annotator agreement on applying the content model and uh, you know, with uh, 10 different pairs of models or um, five different models, then we would get um, inter-annotator reliability using uh, an inter-annotator coefficient uh, like Cohen's kappa, but we happen to use something called Kripendorf's alpha. And we would get, um, you know, very good reliability, where reliability is in the scale minus one to one, where one means the annotators agree, zero means they only agree by chance, minus one you would only get in the case of binary annotation where they're always given the opposite answer. And I see a question from Mary Beth. Yeah, yeah, I, it's kind of related to what Roy was asking, I think. What, so what happens when the material that's being summarized gets more complex and so the number of ideas is, is greater? I that's mean, not I, something I, that we've investigated I in detail. I presume that but, those charts that you have yeah. are all for the same kind of core truth of number of ideas, right? They're all for the same material that was summarized. Mm, sort of. Uh, that's a little bit difficult to judge, but in the data that we were looking at here, um, this was uh, done for many different uh, sets of documents from the news on a particular topic. Okay. And we didn't have a way of counting all the ideas 
in all the news articles. And all the, it was about 30 news articles per topic. And the news articles were a typical length. Okay. So, um, so there was some spread. There was a fair amount of spread. Yes. And this method has actually been used for news. It's been used for educational texts. It's been used for, for material that's not even presented through um, text, but where children have watched a movie that has no soundtrack. Uh, the, the Red Balloon. Probably many of you are familiar with The Red Balloon. Uh, yes. So, um, and then they would tell the story of the red balloon to somebody else. And we found um, that we could apply this method to their narrations of the story. So it's been applied to many different kinds of input. Uh, it's even been applied to input where um, there's no source information that all of the um, subjects are actually viewing and, and or hearing at the same time. We've used it for <clears throat> opinion essays that Dolores collected where the students were just uh, asked to write a persuasive essay on a particular um, issue, like whether or not uh, it had something to do with good nutrition. And uh, we find the same distribution. And actually, some of my colleagues have looked at the distribution of, of um, the kinds of responses you get to cartoon captions uh, for the kinds of things that where the, like the New Yorker, um, uh, um, games where they present a cartoon and people send in their captions. Roy, uh, sorry, Larry, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Just a clarifying question. Is, do you see this device as a way to train students, give them the skill set of going through the process of identifying, you know, uh, the, the key ideas and such, or is it a, and maybe it's both, or is it a tool that they, could, that they might actually employ as they're taking an English class or another class. And I'm thinking, well, Mary Beth, this may go back to your question, because if it's, if it's sort of a simple, and I don't mean simple, but if it's the identification of these key ideas and you're helping me learn how to do that, that's different than a tool I'm using as I'm writing. I would like to see it used in a variety of ways. Okay. I don't uh, work directly with students. So for all of you in the audience who are educators and who do work with students and who would like to um, explore these possibilities, the kinds of things I've imagined are that a student could, um, in a, you know, in an um, intelligent tutoring system, could maybe practice revision. I think that there's mm. just uh, the beginnings of work in NLP on automated revision tools so that students can practice writing. And I... Uh, that's one of the main reasons I want to do educational applications of NLP. I mean, I like to write, and I know that you get better at writing and have more fun writing when you write a lot, and you get feedback, and teachers can't do that. They don't have time to have all of their students write several versions of every writing assignment mm -hmm. and then give them detailed feedback. So I could imagine something like this where if we uh, could work uh, all together, educators and people in HCI and so on, and design the right way to present mm. what um, this method could show to students, then it could be helpful. And one of the things I think might be interesting for students is to see all the different ways you could say the same thing. Mm. So our content units are actually lists of different ways of saying the same thing. They might need to be cleaned up a little bit in order to make sense to students and how you present that, I'm not sure. So I think it could be used that way. I think it could also be used simply by teachers to understand, mm -hmm. well, what is it that the students are getting out mm -hmm. of uh, the content they're supposed to learn? And if there's a quick way to sort of say, well, all the students seem to get these ideas, and here's some other ideas I think are important that they're not getting. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell me about what we can discuss in class? So I, I think there is that those are just two ways, and mm -hmm. I, I think there's others, and I would really love to talk with people about um, how to explore that. Thank you. So um, now I'm going to turn to the automated uh, approaches that we've been developing. And I want to highlight before I start going there that um, there's some very important differences between humans and machines. Uh, humans are um, designed in a way to use language. We're um, language users. And language is actually very multimodal. So we communicate in this very rich way. And people use context in a way that we just barely understand. So humans, when they're building these pyramids, after they learn how, which doesn't really take much time, 
then um, for a given sentence, when they're trying to figure out how to segment the sentence into what are the ideas here, if you give them the idea, sorry, that uh, the idea that they're looking for should be something that's expressed in a clause, then uh, they can do that fairly quickly and they won't consider very many different ways of finding the different ideas in a sentence. Um, now, I uh, said in a clause there because people can also be very, very, very fine grained and you could take every adjective and make it into a new proposition um, and, and think of that as an idea. Um, but uh, this is focused on just finding the ideas that are expressed in clauses so that we stay at a certain level of granularity because that's the most efficient way to do it and it leads to this very high agreement. So when people are doing that, they don't consider you know, all possible ways of breaking up the sentence. Machines don't understand language the same way. And so uh, we actually use um, uh, methods where they consider many possible ways of breaking up the sentence. And then uh, all their decisions are going to be a lot simpler, but they have to make many more of them. And when people make a decision about, well, do these two phrases actually mean the same thing? They're, they're actually looking at the summaries and saying, do both of these summaries mention this particular idea? That's not a hard judgment for people at all. They just do it instantly. They, they sometimes have to think about, well, what actually is the idea that's being expressed here? And that uh, takes shape as they look at the set of summaries in the wise crowd, because that gives them the context about, well, what is the overall topic? Uh, what are the ideas that are important and so on? But um, they make that judgment fairly quickly and it's sort of binary. Uh, there is an iterative process where they can rearrange the pyramid as they go. So it's not hard, uh, you know, set in stone, that's a feature of language that is very flexible. But uh, it's, it's not hard for them to make that judgment. But when we ask machines to make judgments of similarity, we have to have some way of representing the, the meaning of the sentence to the machine. So it's one of the things that I'll be talking about. And then we use metrics that uh, measure the similarity, given some representation of the meaning, typically in a zero to one scale. So it's very continuous. And uh, what's the threshold. What counts as actually being similar enough? That's one of the issues. So one of the uh, key differences and the overall difference between the way a human does this process and the way a machine does this process is that we get many, 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 many possible ways that the machine could do it. And then we tell the machine, well, find the way that optimizes something. And what we optimized for initially was that we'll assign the highest score to the summary. Uh, because we found that that uh, achieved the best trade-off in a, a variety of different things. So they um, basically consider many, many different ways of rearranging these segments and meanings to come up with, well, what seems like the best score and also, um, you know, the highest similarities overall and so on. So that's the general uh, idea and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So um, this just illustrates a human uh, doing a very simple segmentation where here's a sentence. So matter can be measured because it contains volume and mass that occurs in our data, and a person might break it, break it into these two ideas. And this is one of our content units that matter has volume and mass that was found in four of the five um, summaries. And the alignment here is uh, not meaningful, it was just a, a mistake in the slide. Um, so our automated methods do not require lots of large scale machine learning. You don't have to give them a huge data set because we try to do um, methods that either use existing semantic uh, representations or pre-trained uh, meaning representations and to use only the five wise crowd summaries that a human would use. So all the automated methods do that. And I'm going to talk about three. Um, peer score, which was uh, our first attempt. And here we were, we were um, testing the idea of doing uh, something much uh, more um, attuned to the meaning of uh, the phrases that are used in the, in the summaries than our first uh, approach, which just used unigram overlap. Um, that is measuring how many words do they have in common. And uh, things, uh, different uh, words, can be synonyms, and so you don't want to pay too much attention to words, you have to get at the meaning. So we used a distributional semantic method that I'll say a little bit about, but we used brute force segmentation, and I'll, I'll show you what that means 
and, and by considering all possible ways of breaking up the sentence, that meant that, um, of all sentences, that meant that we would uh, have many, many, many cases of things being totally meaningless, but then they would tend to get very low similarity scores and they would just filter out. So I'll tell a little, a little bit about peer score. Now, PEAK, that was designed by Chan Yang, who's right here, um, uh, used open information extraction tools to extract subject predicate object triples. NLP has advanced to the point where uh, these open IE tools that don't have to look for specific kinds of subject predicate object triples, but just take text, any text, and break it up this way. Uh, there's a certain amount of noise, um, but they work fairly well, and it turns out to work quite well in P. And then she used a, an explicit symbolic representation of meaning, an electronic resource called WordNet. How many people here have heard of WordNet? Uh, a fair number of you. Uh, it was developed uh, starting in the 80s at Princeton University by people in um, psychology and um, other related areas. It's um, meant to represent uh, the organization of meanings that uh, people use, um, that verbs uh, are organized very differently than nouns and so on. And um, once this electronic resource was created, then all of a sudden it had this huge impact on, on natural language processing because it was an electronic source of meanings that could be used in a whole range of ways. And people were very creative about it. And um, John uh, has used it in her tool peak. Um, then peer eval, which is brand new and which depends on the work of Yan Jun Gao, who's also here, um, is uh, a little bit more sophisticated than peer score in, in uh, several ways. But the most important way is that it doesn't require uh, an existing manual content model, whereas peer score just assumes you have your content model that people made, and then it will do the scoring. Peer eval uses some of the same ideas uh, with something very uh, important that Yanjin developed, um, and also uh, some other differences are instead of a brute force segmentation, she actually breaks um, sentences down into meaningful units, and then she uses the same distributional semantics that we used in peer score. Uh, so this is what I mean by brute force segmentation. We have um, all matter has energy, volume, and mass. And uh, an n-gram is just some number n of grams, words, in a sequence. So you can have a unigram, one word, and so there's seven unigrams. Or you could have bigrams, that's sequences of uh, two words. So here we have all matter, that's one bigram. So there are many ways to get five unigrams and one bigram. You just move the bigram through here. Uh, then you could do um, all possible combinations with uh, multiple bigrams and so on and so forth. So there's many, 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 many combinations. But machines are really good at doing this kind of repetitive thing. And so that's not hard for a machine. A person would hate doing that. But once you've done that, then it's also, if you have some method of assigning semantics to it, then um, you can get that, and that's why uh, the actual problem for the machine is to put everything together. So the um, peer score semantics uses a latent vector representation of each phrase in the content unit, and it does that by using um, a particular latent semantic uh, method that was developed by someone. Um, so Mona Diab uh, was the supervisor, Wei Wei Guo was the PhD student who is now, um, you know, he finished his PhD many years ago. I think it was 2013. Um, he developed weighted text matrix factorization. Just basically, if you have a matrix, so how many people here are familiar with latent semantic analysis? A fair number. OK, so it's kind of similar. You, you build a matrix where you have um, in your rows all your words in your vocabulary. And then uh, let's say you're using as your context the sentences. You take all the sentences in your corpus, and that becomes your column. And then each um, word is a vector of meaning that, that indicates, did it occur in this sentence? Did it occur in this one? And so on and so forth. And what it tells you is, what other words do I tend to occur with? And you tend to occur with words where your meaning contributes to the overall meaning of the sentence. You tend not to occur with words that have the exact same meaning as you, because there's a substitution process where a different, um, like a paraphrase of that sentence might replace uh, this particular word with a different word. And they, so they wouldn't occur in the same sentence, they would occur with the same neighbors. 
so um, there's a famous phrase that, uh, the, you know, the meaning of a word is taken from the meanings of its neighbors. And so that's the basic idea of um, this latent kind of semantic method. But this creates these huge matrices that are difficult to work with. So you can factor a matrix into a product of two matrices um, where uh, this matrix has been factored into two columns by all the words and then two rows by all the contexts. And uh, the product of these will give you this. And this gives you a way to sort of reduce the dimensionality of the vector that you're using. And you're sort of compressing it. And that turns out to be very useful. And one of the key things about WTMF is that it assigns a small weight to the unseen words that didn't happen to occur in that sentence. Um, some latent semantic methods don't assign any weight to the missing words, and some uh, treat the missing words equally with the words that are present. And uh, what's novel about WTMF is to assign this very small weight. And that, what that does, the advantage that that gives is that for short phrases, it, uh, it, it makes the context bigger. And if you have a short phrase, then you don't have much of a context to have a vector that's meaningful. It's just going to be very sparse. Most of the values in the vector are going to be zero. So um, we train all the vectors offline. That's sort of disappearing down here. But that's the important thing that uh, for the vocabulary of a particular um, summarization test, this can all be trained offline. And in fact, you can just take English and train the vocabulary offline. And um, that means that then uh, this tool could draw on this electronic dictionary without having to do any new training. So the scoring process um, in peer score uh, is that once you have your, all your segments and then all your vectors, uh, you would compare each vector to your content model, to actually to every uh, content unit in the model. And if you have a content unit that has five things in it, you would actually take the average or the median, and we actually tested a variety of things, of um, the cosine similarity to each of the phrases in the content unit. And uh, then try to find the optimal assignment of candidate n-grams to content units. And this is you know, where all the hard work is done. It's basically a maximum weighted independent set problem um, that's kind of schematically represented here, where the idea is that uh, this shows the connectivity of the different nodes. And you notice that the ones that are colored red are independent of all the others. And we have all these constraints where um, a particular phrase cannot be applied to two different content units. It either means this or it means that. So you have to pick one and commit to that in assigning uh, the score to the summary. And there's a variety of other constraints. And we use a greedy algorithm to do that. Um, and uh, that turns out to produce um, results that I will show you in a moment. But now let me talk a little bit about PEAT, um, which is so named because of this pyramid evaluation by automated knowledge extraction, P-E-A-K. And as I said, it applies open IE tools. So for this uh, particular um, sentence, we might get as the subject matter, as the predicate detected and me measured, and as the object because it contains volume and mass. We don't really think of that because clause as the grammatical object, but that's just what an open IE tool might do, but it also would produce this. So it'll produce many alternatives just the way that uh, peer scores segmentation produces many alternatives. So that's what I mean by the, the machine will make many simpler decisions, but then it has all this stuff it has to allocate. Um, that's very different from the way humans do it. And uh, the semantic uh, uh, representation is actually, it's using a tool called Align, Disambiguate, and Walk, which has been found to have very high performance. It does random walks over WordNet. That's basically um, sort of leaping from node to node with, uh, and to discover, you know, what's the probability of going from one node to another um, in, in a way that I won't go into more detail on, but uh, WordNet is very large. So this turns out to produce uh, results that, as you will see, are quite strikingly good, uh, but it's also um, very expensive computationally. So um, this is a, a kind of schematic of what, speak, of what Peak is doing. So from different reference summaries, it actually constructs this model by using a hypergraph. And what that is is a graph 
where some of the nodes are connected in a hyper edge so that you can distinguish them from nodes that are not in the same hyper edge. And our hyper edges are all this, the, um, that they connect the subject predicate object that came from the same sentence. And that's, we do that because we don't want to compare the similarity of the subject to its object. We want to see if this sentence, SPO triple, is similar to an SPO triple from um, another sentence. And here we have the alternatives, uh, uh, triple one from sentence one and triple two from sentence one. That might be the one about um, uh, matter being easy to detect because it has volume and mass. So that might be the one and this might be the other. But then we'd have sentence two and we connect edges from one node to other nodes if the similarity between the edges is above a certain threshold. And then um, there's a lot of other processing that goes on to sort of find, well, uh, which of these triples is salient and how to compare them across different summaries. And then finally, we end up with content units being represented as a weighted triple. And the weight is just the number of different summaries that contributed to the overall similarity of a bunch of triples. And it, it ends up producing something that looks a little bit different from a human pyramid because there's sort of alternative views of the same content unit. But uh, otherwise, it's uh, very similar in having a sort of predication that's weighted. And one of the things that's quite distinct about um, peak from the other method is that it actually has some notion of an ordering of the content. The subject comes first, then the predicate, and then the object. So even if it doesn't know what the real object is, it knows that there's a linear sequence here, which uh, is something that I think helps its performance. Uh, then to do the scoring, it creates the, a bipartite graph of the triples that are the content units and the triples that it will find in a new summary. And then um, it uh, assigns edges at the semantic similarity of the entire triple, which is an average over the uh, similarities of the individual subject and predicates and objects, is greater than 0.5. And then it uses this um, uh, particular algor algorithm, Lucas Kuhn, or sometimes known as the Hungarian algorithm, to uh, find the best uh, allocation of um, edges. And the, it needs some notion of the cost of uh, selecting a particular edge, which has to do with the weights of the content units. So that's a high level view of what peak does. Um, now, peer eval extends peer score, it builds a full pyramid. And in order to do that, it had to be able to handle this really complicated um, problem that I'll illustrate in the next slide where there's sets of sets of sets. Um, and I see Larry making some gestures about maybe I have, don't, I don't have so much time left. So do you want me to wrap it up? I'm wondering if this is, um, I was just wondering, I don't want to cut you short. I, I had about 30 slides okay. or maybe 32. I just want so to make I, sure we save time to get engagement. Yeah, so, so uh, I'll, I'll uh, okay go through this rather quickly then. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, it decomposes sentences in a more meaningful way. It uses the same distributional semantics, but we actually tested a variety of other methods. So if you're familiar with word to vec or glove, we tested these in different ways of combining the word embeddings to get a phrase embedding, and WTMF uh, way outperformed them. Um, we're still looking into why. And it uses the same scoring algorithm, apart from the fact that it doesn't do all this sort of very stupid segmentation. Um, but the interesting new development is that it, it's got this new set allocation method, which is a nested bin packing problem. And the nested sets are that every sentence has a set of segmentations. So there's one way you could segment it, and then there's another way, and then there's another way. And so there's you know maybe uh, around three or four different segmentations that you get for every sentence. And every content unit is a set of segments, each from a different summary. And every pyramid layer, where all the content units have the same weight, is another set. So we have sets of sets of sets. And so making sure you obey all the constraints is a very complicated problem that um, Yangjin solved this summer. And uh, she named her method Edua because it, it could apply to other similar problems. The idea is that it does emergent discovery of units of attraction. Um, it, it breaks things up and then it sees how they attract and it does this emergent discovery of what are the units that you end up with. So um, it's kind of named in a way to capture what this cognitive process is. 
but basically it does it by constructing this huge graph where the nodes are segments, the edges are weighted by the force of attraction, which uh, for us is the um, semantic similarity. And this is just illustrating um, part of the processing that uh, ends up uh, happening. The, the um, dashed edges are that the attraction between any two nodes, which is uh, a segment, a phrase that gets its vector representation is greater than some threshold. And um, so it starts out with everything being connected by these dashed edges, but then it tries to connect things into content units. So once it ends up with solid edges, uh, all there, there would be this um, fully connected subgraph where this is similar to that and it's similar to this and it's, it has to be similar to everything else in the content unit. Then this becomes a little content unit. So here we have a content unit of weight five and one of weight um, and uh, these are all the constraints it uses. I probably won't go into detail here, but you can see um, there's constraints on the average similarity uh, within the content unit and then within each layer and then of the whole pyramid. There's uh, the capacity of each layer. It tries to obey this Zipfian distribution using this uh, formula. Uh, the size of each layer has to be increasingly uh, big. Uh, no empty layers and uh, one segmentation per sentence. You can't like, you have to commit. <laughs> mm. um, so uh, then I uh, point out here that Perry, Val, and humans construct very similar pyramids. So uh, this particular pyramid that we're looking at, Perry, Val constructed 69 content units, and we had many different annotators do this. They'll construct different numbers, but one annotator had 60, another had 46. I actually have another pyramid that has more. Um, and what, what happens is that people tend to vary much more with the weight one um, content units. It also has very similar distributions. Here are two examples where they have the same weight and it's basically the same idea. And I just arbitrarily picked one of the phrases for each one to show you that there's a lot of different phrases in there, but they all get grouped together. And then here's two that have different weight, but they're very similar weight. So the pyra that's what I mean by the pyramids looking very similar. So here's the rubric. Uh, for the passage where a, a lot of students were actually um, given a variety of contextualized intervention uh, in community college in order to uh, help boost their preparation for college, which is uh, what their end goal finally was. And researchers identified 14 main ideas in the text and uh, the inter-annotator re reliability for that rubric was very high, 0.92. So that's what we started out with, and we wanted to see uh, how similar would this pyramid evaluation be to that. Um, but first, we wanted to see if we did the manual annotation, how similar would our um, automated methods be to the manual annotation in, in terms of what score got assigned to a summary. Peer score is the highest, but remember, it's actually using the human created pyramid. Um, peak and peer eval are really, really pretty similar, and they're both high. Uh, but they just happen to use different methods. Uh, this is actually the correlation of the main ideas scores of all 120 summaries with the automated methods, and that's also very high. And again, it's probably higher for peer score because it's uh, only half automated and it's half manual. So our, our view is that content, these content scores are somewhat transparent and could support feedback in the ways that Larry asked me about and that I went into. So in conclusion, um, this particular method works well to identify these kinds of important ideas that are emergent uh, if you have a wise crowd. It happens to correlate with a completely independently developed uh, main ideas rubric. And I, if people have questions about where the differences are, I could uh, talk about that. I think I still remember. And it requires only the five reference summaries. You only need five people who would do the same task the students do that you consider um, experts in some way. Maybe they're more advanced students, which is what we use. And we have these fully automated methods, um, Perry, Val, and Peak now, that uh, basically are pre-trained. There is a certain amount of parameter tuning, like what should the thresholds be and a variety of other things. Um, and uh, we have found that um, when we test on our automated summarizers, uh, they perform a little bit less well because the sentences are very complex, um, but we're, we're actually developing new methods for that. So we want to continue developing this. And uh, if we have students that are working with more complex text, it might 
also be an issue. issue. But we do think that there's a big potential for this to inform revision, either by helping the teacher get an overview of what's going on in the class, or by having students uh, work in pairs or individually with some kind of automated system. We're, we're uh, interested in, in not stopping with summaries, uh, but moving on to essays. Summaries are pretty easy because uh, you only have the same idea. You only have uh, each idea mentioned once in a summary. You don't have any real discourse structure, but in an essay, you'll have the same ideas referenced multiple times in different ways with paraphrase, uh, which we're already dealing with, but uh, also definite descriptions, the evidence shown here, or deictic pronouns, this indicates. So resolving all of that is um, a problem that we are going to try to address. Um, and then we, we need to understand the relationships among the ideas in the text, and that's uh, something that we're interested in working on. And that's probably quite different for different kinds of texts, like discursive versus argumentative. And there's a, lot, a fair amount of literature uh, among colleagues I've come to know in um, uh, the psychology of education on how argumentation is quite different in history than it is in science, for example. So there's a whole world of interesting issues to get into. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, Thank you. I, uh, one, yeah, something I that came up with it, it, in my mind was this idea of the wise crowd and mm. what happens when the crowd isn't wise. So, for instance, common myths. Um, mm. For example, I teach leadership, and a common myth actually is that the happy worker is a good worker. So, even though the lesson will say, you know, that's not true. What I see in papers all the time is happy worker is a good worker because it's just so ingrained in the culture. Mm. So how does, how do these systems deal with that? Mm. Well, um, when you say these systems, there's actually a fair amount of work on crowdsourcing of all kinds of things. It's being used more and more um, and in different disciplines. So that, that's a pretty big question. I can really only speak to uh, NLP. One of the things that's not dealt with here that I'm also interested in uh, that I think will be related to this issue of how the ideas are connected to each other, which our model over, you know, it doesn't address at all. It's just a list of weighted ideas. I think the weights are very important because not all ideas are equal. And the same idea might be important in one context and not another. But in that long tail, um, there's going to be a lot of stuff in the long tail that's just irrelevant. Mm. But there will also be real nuggets of information that only a few people perceive. And how would we find those? So there's certainly mm. Uh, mm. questions about, well, uh, the crowd has a certain amount of wisdom, and we've seen that over and over again, but it's not perfect. Mm. And maybe we need other methods. And so there's... Uh, a whole arena in um, various uh, kinds of AI and, and computer science called anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. And so uh, finding the really great idea buried in that long tail might be a form of anomaly detection. And it would re require methods mm -hmm. devoted just to that. Yeah, just to, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. But, go ahead. Right know, right here. <laughs> 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 just to follow up on that. like. One uh, devil's advocate position is to say what the crowd knows is the lowest common denominator, right? That's what you're getting. You're getting the stuff that the most people know, mm. right? Or that the most people I would, I would say, say, yes, it's most people, but right. I wouldn't say it's the lowest common denominator. Right, right. There's yeah. all kinds of problems that people have shown can be solved more easily by getting answers from a huge crowd and then having some method to combine it. Right, but it, it comes down to, I think, and it's related to your question, kind of a value system for what you really want. And I think uh, your, your case of summaries is a great one because that is a fairly generic thing that you want. You really want a list of, you know, whatever. But when you really want to talk about creativity or nuance, all your, yes. your points about connections and argumentation, yeah, that's going to, well, mm. yeah, there's you know, some that's things, your future, right? That's there's your some future. things that the crowd can't do. Yeah. So the crowd cannot... Yeah. sculpt David. But, but for example, your, your, uh, your test example, if you had a summary or a, a, a paper that said, now some people might think that a happy worker is a good worker, there's a good, there's a good clue, right? You would mm -hmm. seize on that and say, oh, this yeah. person has it. 
right? Because they set up that contrast yeah. of received wisdom. Well, well crowd, but, crowd, but wisdom, the, crowd wisdom in the truth. Thing. But one of the things that uh, crowd wisdom does is it doesn't trust any one individual. Mm. And the question is, how do you combine the answers to get an answer that rises above the crowd? And uh, Dalton uh, was the first person to talk about this kind of methodology. He asked people at a fair to guess the weight of an ox. And they would look at it and they would guess. And no one person uh, could be picked out as, oh, this person will have the right answer. But taking the average of everybody's answer turned out to be very precise. Mm, so the question is, how do you combine the answers? And that's sort of what's going on here. How do you combine what you get out of all these summaries. Uh, and then I think you have, to, this, you have to judge, how many people do you have to collect a guess from in order to get something where you have a very small margin of error around your average? Well, so I think that's the part that adds rigor to using the crowd. You have to ask how many people, what people, what question, how do you combine it? So it's not that you just take the lowest common denominator. I, I think there's a, there's a a whole uh, set of questions about how you rely on that and many things as you say that you cannot address that way but there are some things you can only address that way um yes yeah so um sort of piggybacking on that um uh, i was wondering if uh, uh how adaptable your system is if i want to introduce uh sort of an expert uh who would come in and overrule the crowd on certain things, the expert doesn't have enough time. The crowd brings up most of the things right, but maybe the expert comes in and knocks out one of these sentences or one of the topics, and then can the system be run again? To oh, yes. Use that as an overrule. And oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, um, you could uh, imagine a situation where a teacher uh, wouldn't stop with five, and might have five this year, but then keep collecting, you know, wants to use the same assignment and might, you know, review uh, the wise crowd, you know, actual writings and throw some out and add new ones. You don't have to stop with five. You can, and it's going to get more and more precise if you add more. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, you can, that's the beauty of having it automated. You drop in a new wise crowd member, you just run the whole thing again. Mm -hmm. Jesse, this might have to be our last one for okay. you. Jesse? I just have a really quick comment. Yeah. I was trying to visualize the interface for this. Oh, yeah. And I totally see it being a joint thing, actually, kind of like what you were saying. And actually, what you were saying also about how the instructor's role is still so important because yes. of the subjectivity of what you're grading. And it would be awesome if, like, in the paper, these ideas were highlighted. And so grading just becomes like reading through the highlights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which yes. could really still save a lot of time. Yes. Uh, actually, um, Sean, uh, why don't you stand up, Sean, just so that people see your face, because I want to mention your work on high text. Uh, she is actually doing some research on how highlighting texts with a different way of finding important sentences that's based on uh, deep learning um, improves reading comprehension. And she's trying to build on that work. And I, I'm, I hope you don't feel uh, shy about me having you stand up. But many of the people in this room, I think, uh, either work with um, human computer interaction and uh, experiments and so on. So they might be people who would be interested in talking to you. So she's actually done this not for this particular method, but for, uh, and, and not for working with students, but for um, just reading comprehension in general. And she's found that it speeds reading comprehension and it makes it more correct. If you, and it, she uses graded highlighting. So the most important sentences are the most highlighted and then there's sort of uh, shading down to white. And it, it's, a, it's, so I think, yes, that's one way to do it. And one of the things that she emphasizes about that is that then you see the important idea in its context and you could look around if you want or not if you want, but it's, it's right there. Um, so, it, so it leaves things more open to that. Becky, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by with what you're, I tell you I am, I'm, I'm just my, no, I, I know, and I know, my, I suspect you can probably go on for a couple yeah, more I, hours. I, I, I know talk. there are more questions in the group, so what I'm going to do is invite you to come up with Becky. We're going to close off today's session. We've got one or two things to share with you, but please join me in thanking Becky again for a stimulating, amazing, I wish I had this back when I was in school.
So um, just two quick points. I just want to point out, this was our first. Uh, our next EdTech Connect will be uh, January 25th with uh, David Miller in electrical engineering. And Becky, you mentioned the words anomaly. How did you use that? Anomaly detection. So that's what David's going to be talking about. So uh, oh. I have the title. Okay. We're working on We're trying to get his title exactly where he's comfortable, but that's in it. So I just want to make a point. We'll be getting out Wh more who's, information. Who's talking about it? David Miller. Oh, David. Yeah, yeah. I know a couple of Davids. Oh, okay. One in you know engineering and one in ISP. This one is in, uh, in engineering. Engi David. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, so we'll be putting that together. And I want to introduce Darren Cudre as well. And he's going to share a little bit about the Nittany AI Challenge. Thank you. As a father of two, two daughters, uh, 13 and 9, and going through their reading comprehension tests, I can tell you, I really appreciate what you're, you showed here today. And Becky is an entrepreneur. <laughs> I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I'm, I'm thinking of ideas of how to take this and, and get it out to the market. And actually, We're, we're talking to the patent lawyers right are now. Are you really? Yeah. yeah I, I think there's some really good opportunities even to gamify what you're doing here and to get students really interested in trying to get that better summary. Yep. Uh, so what I wanted to tell you a little bit about, just take the opportunity while you're all here, there's a, uh, for those of you here in attendance, you won't have this online, but there's a, a paper in front of you called the Nittany AI Challenge. Uh, we did a challenge similar to this last year. We called it the Nittany Watson Challenge because IBM provided the the, the support and technology with Watson, but this year we're extending it. So it's not going to be just Watson. It's going to be uh, Microsoft Azure. It's, it's likely going to include Amazon's web services and Lex. And, and, and actually any AI that a team wants to bring to the table, they can. We're just, we're just reaching out to these other companies and getting special training and support and mentorship, et cetera. So I would ask you all, to let your classes know that this exists. I think it's a great opportunity for students to get involved in actually getting hands-on experience of working with AI. And what we do is we'll put together some specific challenges. What we try to do is we try to make this very engaging for the students. It's something that they can put on their resume that they actually worked on real projects involving AI. But the other thing we do is we put real challenges um, for the teams to work on. I say real, it's it's real problems that Penn State's facing, and we give the students an opportunity to say, hey, what would you do? And it's not just students, it's faculty and staff. I'll give you an example, last year, we had a, a, a large group of staff actually submit, and they went all the way through where they looked at how Watson could be used to help address the transfer credit challenge that we have here at Penn State. How can you streamline that? I know, I know you all probably said, no, we don't have a problem, do we? But <laughs> yeah. So, so that's leading to somewhere. Now we're looking at potentially doing a project uh, uh, with AI to actually help solve that. And there's other, a student team, I'll give you another example. So we, we present these specific challenges that Penn State's facing, but we also say, hey, look, we don't want to squelch creativity. So there's this wild card category. So if you want to just submit an idea that has nothing to do with the ideas we give, gave you, that's okay. A student team did that last year and they came up with a collaborative note taking tool so imagine you all are sitting here taking notes because I'm, what I'm saying is so important. Um, but you're all taking notes and Watson is pulling electronically from the notes you're taking and creating a master note so that maybe you missed a, a certain key concept as you were writing notes from before. You can go look at that master note and see, okay, did I miss something? And the other thing is key that they're looking at is how can they take those notes and provide a faculty interface to say, hey, did the students get what you were trying to teach that day? Like, what's the, what was the confidence level on the notes they were actually taking compared to what the course content was? Anyway, I think it's a brilliant idea in there. We started an LLC, and they're starting to go down that path. In fact, of the five, we call them minimal viable products, MVPs, that came out of last year's challenge, three of them already created LLCs to begin pursuing their idea. And, and one of the ideas where it actually looks like we're going to do a, a project here at the university to help solve a challenge. So I tell you all that to say, this group is important. If you can get that, if you can get this out to students, and actually there was a group, there was a group from Harrisburg, uh, a faculty member down there turned this into their capstone project for their class. Um, but if, if you can get the word out to your students, and also the one of the things we're requiring this year that we didn't last year 
is we want a faculty or staff person to serve as an advisor for every team. So in other words, if a group of students get together and say, hey, we're going to do this, and if they don't have a faculty or staff advising them, we're going to ask them to go pursue getting a, a faculty member or staff member to, to serve as that advisor. So even if you sit, sitting here in the room or online, if you, if you don't have a specific idea that you want to pursue and get a team, you could also, hey, look, but I'm willing to serve as an advisor. And it's a way to, to kind of get engaged and, you know, work with some students and, and uh, do it that way. Key dates, we're going we're gonna to kick this off officially on December 19th. And then the actual ideas uh, that we'll review and then select are due on January 29th. So we're going to try to get some stuff out so that people can look at it, the, particularly the students can look at things over break, look at the different companies that are involved, maybe do some of the training, digest some stuff, and then come back in January, submit some ideas. What we end up doing is selecting 10 prototypes, and we provide funding for those teams to go build 10 prototypes. And then we, of those 10 prototypes, we select five, provide additional round of funding to then go build MVPs on those five. I think it's just a, an amazing way to, as a, as a collective, it's not just about students, it's not just about staff, it's not just about faculty. It's getting that, the group working together in synergy to really see what we can do and, and grounded in solving some real problems. So I just wanted to say thanks for your help in advance and hopefully we can get some of your students and some of, some of you involved. Thank you.